Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, welcome everyone again to Global London, uh, City for Business and Finance. So, uh, I think we've got a few more people coming in. Come on in. I'll have to. Careful with the camera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, careful with the camera, yeah. Um, so, welcome again now. As we spoke about in week one, there's a lot to forming a city of business and enterprise. It's not just about um, the having finance, you've got to have a big population, you've got to have transport, you've got to have places to go, you've got to have places to eat. So we're going to visit some arts and culture, we're going to visit some technology, all sorts of things. And last week we went to Canary Wharf, which was originally for trade, but has now in the later years become a place of finance. And next week, uh, the visit is to the city, a guided tour of the city, to find out what's there. And Jakob's going to introduce you today to a bit more about um, what the key features are of the, of the history of London and how it all came about. Okay. So very welcome, uh, Jakob. I know you'll know a few of them because they're yeah. finance. Some of, you are, some of you are in my finance class investments, so welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning. So mm -hmm. I want to talk about this morning about London as a centre for finance. And it's a little bit of a, uh, of a history, history lesson and what's happening now. Okay, so you get a little bit of an overview of what's happening here. Uh, so perhaps I talk for 20, 30 minutes and then you have any questions, ask questions. Okay, so a little intro, then I'll talk about the historic overview of two major institutions, one being the London Stock Exchange and the other one the Bank of England, okay, which are the two major kind of cornerstones of of London as a financial center. Uh, then we talk about banks and merchant banks, about asset management, hedge funds, private banks, wealth management, a little bit about Brexit, and then uh, some kind of conclusions of where we are and what the outcome is. So, so perhaps to kick off, so London, is London a financial center? Yes, it definitely is a financial center. Uh, why? Because we are here. No, that's a joke. Uh, it, it is a financial center because it has a few uh, it has a few attributes that makes it ideal for, for trade. First of all, it has been a center for trade of the last three four hundred years. Okay, the United Kingdom previously, the British Empire always was a country that looked out to other countries, to Asia, to Africa, to to America, and always had trading relationships. And on the back of the trading relationships, you need finance, because you need to finance it. You need to transfer money, you need to finance it, uh, and so forth and so on. So it has been a financial center for over 300 years. And you will see, if we look at the institutions of the, of the Bank of England and the London Stock Exchange, you will see that as well. Okay? So it's got a long track record in, in actually being a financial center. It is a financial center for actually a few different asset classes, okay? Foreign exchange, okay, so currency trading. Why? Because we're doing, we've been doing this trading in real goods for the last three, four hundred years, so you always have a need and then of changing your currency, going to another currency and trading it. Equities, equity trading, last few, last few hundred years, and we're going to talk a little bit about the London Stock Exchange and then about the banks, what they do, and so forth and so on. So, equity trading, definitely here, London, and then the London Stock Exchange with the share trading and so on, one of the sectors. Okay? The relatives in the last 50 years has grown significantly, but the derivatives trading is not new to. London, actually, uh, if you look at history, already in the 17th century, people traded derivatives such as options and, and, and derivatives like instruments back then, 300 years, which is actually quite amazing. Some people think derivatives, calls and puts and futures and so on, are new instruments. They are not, as we know them from agriculture, they go back thousands of years, but in terms of trading, we've had it here for at least 300 years. And then bonds, we used to call them euro bonds, because they had nothing to do with Europe or Euro, the Euro is a currency. They were called Euro bonds because they, because they were issued outside the domicile, the jurisdiction of a country in an international market. And we called it the Euro market. Now it's a bit confusing because now we have the Euro as a currency and some people think these are kind of 
euro denominated bonds now. They can be denominated euro, they can be denominated in dollars and so on. They're usually denominated in a currency different from the home currency of the issuer and outside the domicile of the issuer. Okay, so euro bonds and global bonds uh, since the late 60s, London was the first center that started that and is now a major part of funding, financing of corporate activities for, uh, for corporates who don't want to issue in the local market. Why not in the local market? Because the local market usually is very limited in terms of size, in terms of investors. In London as a global market gives you the investor base, but also gives you the, uh, the advantage of the jurisdiction of London in the United Kingdom, the English language, in English uh, um, um, uh, law that makes it favorable. Okay, so we talked about this. So infrastructure. Okay, so for any financial center, the infrastructure is key. Okay, so what is infrastructure? Infrastructure obviously has to do with you need to have a stock exchange, you need to have a marketplace where people can trade, but you also need to have people who are talented, who want to come here. Okay? The other infrastructure is that we're in the right time zone because we're between America and Asia. Okay? We are on the, on, on, on the edge of Europe, we just exited the European Union, but we're part of Europe, one hour ahead, which sometimes is a bit of a problem. Uh, or behind, better to say, but we're in the European time zone, but we can capture America, we can capture Asia. Okay, so this is very good English language, um, good law here, uh, lawyers, accountants, lots of talent, people want to come here, and, and, and then a peaceful country. Okay? We haven't had a war here in, on, on the island for hundreds of years. Okay? So, so that is very, very important. But also infrastructure in terms of having very good technology here, and we constantly invest into that and so on. And it is very, very important. People, obviously, is very important. Okay? And we, we attract all the time people here. With Brexit, without Brexit, we're talking about a little bit at the end. And people want to come here, they want to live here. Even though the weather is not always nice, but people come here because it gives you freedom, it gives you flexibility, it gives creativity. So we, 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 we attract all kinds of people. Whether you are from France, or Germany, or India, or Australia, or America, people want to come here and work here, and so on. The language obviously is an, is an advantage. So that's the kind of basic introduction of, so there is something here, and I want to look at some of these institutions and the players in order to understand a little bit better. Okay? So, there are two major institutions that are the backbone of this financial center. Okay? One is the Bank of England, and I just put here together a few slides that shows you here what is actually this Bank of England, what does it do, and why is it important. Okay. So first of all, there's some confusion sometimes about the Bank of England, and some people say, oh, it's a private bank, and they can do what they want to do, and it's, uh, uh, there are even some videos, some fake videos out there that it's dominated and owned by the Rothschilds, and they dominate it, and they run it, and so on. It's all wrong. Okay? It's a public body that needs to report to the parliament. It actually was founded in 1964, yes, as a private bank. It's a private bank for, uh, the, uh, as a banker to the government. Because back then, there were hardly any banks. We had some banks, early uh, uh, parts of banks in, in Italy, but we don't know really banks. So in, 1960, in 1694, <coughs> the Bank of England was started as a private bank with shareholders. These shareholders were other private individuals and, and, and institutions and so on. In 1964, uh, 1946, it's got nationalized. Okay, since 1946, the Bank of England is owned by the government, Okay? It's no longer private, no longer has called private shareholders, and is responsible as to answer questions to the parliament. Okay? So that's very important. Okay? And today it is the central bank. Okay? It's a central bank means it is it stands uh, above the commercial banks and the investment banks. So it's and we see in a second what 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 the what the responsibilities of the central bank is and whether it's dependent or not dependent. But the central bank is essential for a proper working financial market, you know, for a proper working um, financial center, for trade and for, 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 for financial transactions. So we said 1946 got nationalized. Okay, so since then, 
owned by the government with a charter and responsibilities as a central bank. Okay? In 1997, it got independent, independent from the government. Okay, what does that mean? From 46 until 97, it was obviously had to answer to the parliament, it means to the parliamentarians and to the, uh, to the committees, but the, the treasury and the prime minister could influence it, could use it. Okay? In 1997, the government decided, and the country decided to make it independent. That means it still has to answer to the parliament, okay? but the treasury, the secretary, treasury secretary, can no longer influence it. Cannot say you have to do this, you have to print more money, or you have to a lower or, 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 or a lower raise, uh, 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 raise interest rates. Okay, so it's independent. Okay, so it's very important. In 2012, it, it got after the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, it got new responsibilities, so responsibilities of supervision of financial markets. It was in charge of supervising the banks before, but now it's got more um, uh, more responsibilities. Okay, um, so that was in 2012, and it is we created two uh, regulators in 2012. One being the Financial Conduct Authority (FCA), previously the FSA, and the PRA, the Prudential Regulation Authority, which actually looks after the banks and controls the banks. Okay. Um, so now the, the new Bank of England is in charge of supervising all the banks and other financial institutions. With regards to supervising uh, asset managers, there's another uh, uh, um, uh, supervisory body called the FCA. So the FCA would look after hedge funds and asset managers and so forth. So, so they split. Previously, the FSA, Financial uh, uh, Securities Authority, until 2008-2009, looked after all of them. They were too big, and we felt there was a conflict of interest. And it obviously makes sense that the central bank that sets the interest rates and so on is also in charge of making sure, looking into the banks and making sure that there is no, uh, that there are no improper transactions going on or, 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 or developments in the banks. So now the Bank of England has got uh, three committees. So the working comes of committees. You have a governor at the moment, Mark Carney. It's going to be replaced very soon by a new person, somebody from within the uh, uh, from within the, uh, the, the the Bank of England. Okay. So we have three committees. One is the Monetary Policy Committee. That is a committee that sets the monetary policy. Okay. You need to understand that in a country, you have two. Uh, two policies, one being monetary policy, the other one being fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is what the Treasury does, okay, the Ministry of Finance. Okay? They are setting the taxes that we have to pay and they are making payments to us. Okay? The Monetary Policy Committee sets the interest rates and buys and sells bonds into the markets. So regulates the uh, kind of influences the level of interest rates. Okay, they also print money and they're in charge of money circulation and statistics, marketing, and really have to see. And then we have the Prudential Regulation Committee, which looks after the looks after the uh, the banks and makes sure that it regulates them. It's all chaired by the government. Okay, and then there are some outside people in there. So it is a very transparent process. And if you look at the website of the Bank of England, it's very transparent. Their minutes and their constant information that they put out and so on, so we know what they do. Okay, so for example, when they, uh, when there is a, a, a meeting of the uh, monetary uh, policy committee and they change the interest rates, so they don't change the interest rate. There's a press conference and then there is uh, information that goes out that explains why they do things and what are the plans and so on. So it's, it has to be very interesting. Okay, so here just a few words about what is monetary policy. We sometimes people aren't very clear about that. Monetary policy is the action that the country, central bank or government can take to influence how much money is in the economy and how much cost it costs to borrow. Okay, so they're in charge of the circulation of money. Okay, so how much money is out there in terms of banknotes and in terms of coins. Okay, uh, 
obviously they're also then directly and indirectly in charge of all the other money aggregates. So this is M1, right? M1 being uh, banknotes in points. Then there's M2, the checks, and M3, other money that is created in the banking system. So the M3 as a, a wider definition of money is much larger than M1 and M2. Okay? So they're in charge of the money circulation, but also in charge of setting interest rates. Okay, so we say here, two main monetary policy tools. One is to set the interest rates, okay, that we charge banks to borrow money, okay, so they are setting interest rates that then is usually the discount rate, okay, in the US it's called the Fed funds, if you haven't heard the, the term, the Fed obviously being the largest central bank in the world, the Fed funds, here we have the discount rate, sometimes you also have some other rates that they have for other instruments, for example, the Lombard rate for the, uh, for the discounting of checks and so forth and so on. But usually the discount rate is the kind of, is, is the kind of a benchmark rate that you have. Um, and um, so that's the first one, setting interest rates. But they only set the short-term interest rate. They don't set the long-term interest rate. Okay, so if you think about it, interest rates you probably know from other finance classes, interest rates go from one day to 30 years or for 60 or 70 years, if you have a yield curve that goes all the way out there, where you have the country issues bonds, government bonds, the country cannot, cannot really influence the mid-term or long-term interest rates, unless they do something like this, which is called quantitative easing, buying these bonds. And so, but even this is kind of questionable to what extent they can influence it. But obviously, they are setting the short-term interest rate, okay? And then they hope that we're setting the short-term interest rate that will then have an impact on the entire year. Okay? Uh, but the second tool is actually creating money digitally by buying corporate bonds and other bonds, not just corporate bonds. In, for example, in the Eurozone, the ECB buys other buys government bonds of Italy, Germany, and so forth and so on. So on the one hand, the country issues bonds, on the other hand, the central bank comes, comes in and buys the bonds back. Okay? Sounds a little bit crazy, right? And it is crazy, right? Because on the one hand, the country issues the bonds. On the other hand, a, a, the country needs uh, in, in a way, which is the central bank, buys them these bonds back. Why do they do that? Because we want to lower these interest rates, okay? We need money out of that. In the UK, we do that as well. So the Bank of England would buy a certain amount of gills and, and other gills being the UK government bonds, okay? But they also buy corporate bonds and others, okay? And when they do that, they buy the bonds by buying the bonds. Bond price goes up because they buy them, and the yields go down. Okay, so they try to influence the midterm rates, not the very long term. Sometimes they can even buy in some some countries. They decide even to buy longer term bonds, and that's what we call quantitative easing. Okay, QE. You've heard of QE. Okay, in the U.S. in the last three years, until probably a year ago, we had QT, quantitative tightening. Okay? Because when countries think that interest rates are too low, inflation is coming back and the economic activity would allow to raise interest rates. What they then do is then they are selling the bonds into the market. Okay? This quantitative tightening means when I sell the bonds into the market, there are more bonds available. Okay? That means actually the interest rates go slowly up. It's very important. Very important tool, these two pools. Tools. We call it now quantitative easing, but in the in the past we just called it open market policy (OM). Okay, uh, open market transactions. Okay, uh, we now call it mainly QE. Very important tool because the setting of interest rates. How much can you change these interest rates? You can only change them every three months, and you are you are you are, you are uh, limited to that. So then we said prudential regulation, the bank. Uh, uh, the Bank of England regulates and supervises financial services, in particular the banks, okay, in other monetary institutions, not the, uh, not the, the funds, as we said. Banknotes, very important, okay, at the moment we have over 3.8 billion Bank of England notes in circulation, worth about 71 billion, okay. So that's very, very important, okay. It's also important, obviously, that these banknotes are in good quality. So in the last few years, we've seen new banknotes being issued in better quality. So, if, for example, you see that countries that are 
uh, they have a stable financial system, they will have banknotes, they cannot be, uh, cannot be um, uh, uh, reproduced and are, are safe and so forth. Okay. Uh, interesting thing, in the UK, we got five pound note with 10, 20, and 50, and that's it, okay? No bank note bigger than 50. It's quite interesting, right? If you think, for example, in Europe, you have like 100 euros, even 500 euros, okay? So here in this country, we prefer not to have big notes, and we prefer not to use too much cash, and as you know, now we're going even into a, into a world where actually cash is less and less used, it's more about um, yeah, digital payments and so forth. It's very, very important still. Okay? Then they do education. Then gold is a very important factor of what they do, in that the Bank of England has got a very large gold vault, second largest after <laughs> the Federal Reserve. And if the Bank of England <coughs> is holding gold, not just the, the gold that the United Kingdom owns, but also uh, holds gold for other countries. Okay. In some cases, then, these countries then decide, hey, I want to repatriate my gold. Okay. So a few years ago, we had the case of where some countries wanted to go back. Okay. So then this gold kind of leaves the vaults. Okay. But that's very important. Okay. And then they publish statistics okay, about monetary uh, uh, policy and the monetary financial system. So, so that was the bank feeling. Very important. Important for the stability, important to give stability, to give guidance so we understand where interest rates go. It's very important for private individuals who either want to invest money or want to borrow money because that is all linked to the interest rates. Okay? And obviously to the, to the, uh, to the corporates and so on. Okay. Second major institution, London Stock Exchange. Okay? London Stock Exchange is one of the oldest stock exchange in the world. It can trace its history back to 300 years ago. Okay. Um, um, it says here the London Stock Exchange Group was created in 2007 when they merged with the Milan Exchange. So you need to understand that there are lots of stock exchanges in the world. Okay. In the US, until a few years ago, we had local stock exchange in many different cities. Okay. In the United Kingdom, in the last 50 years, we only had the London Stock Exchange. In the past, there were exchanges in other parts of the country. And for example, if you look at Germany, in Germany you still have a stock exchange in Frankfurt, you have a Berlin exchange, you have an exchange I think, in Stuttgart, and so forth. And so, so in some countries, you still have kind of other trading, uh, trading places and so on. In London, the only uh, stock exchange here, but we have other exchanges, such as the Metals Exchange and the Rivlis Exchange, and so forth. And so, on. Okay? so what, is it, what, is it, what is a stock exchange? It's an official place where you can trade shares. Okay, in the secondary market. It's also important for the primary market because when a company comes to the market to the, for the first time, it has to be launched somewhere in the public market. So the stock exchange has got two functions. A, primary market for new issues and then secondary market for ongoing trading. Okay? We say here that uh, the, the, early, it's kind of the, the early history goes back to 1698 when in a coffee house people started issuing list of stocks in commodity prices and started trading. That shows you the creativity of the country here. So people here already in the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century, had here the idea of kind of let's issue stocks, let's get let's get a hold of some great idea. Because what is what, what does it mean to buy shares? You like an idea and you want to participate in that. And the one who issues the shares needs the funds in order to fund the business. Okay? Why was that here? Because our ships went to India and went to America and so on. So people that needed money to find stuff. Good. In 1801, the first regulated exchange comes into existence in London, and the modern stock exchange is born. Okay, so officially a bit more than 200 years. Okay, so 220 years now. Okay. 1986 was a very important year. By the way, in 1986, I came to London for the first time. I was born in Austria, and I lived in France and other parts of the world. And in 1986, I was here on a study trip with my university, and I visited the London Stock Exchange and the Bank of England and some other institutions and so on. We mentioned earlier, uh, Simon, Professor Samuel Leary mentioned uh, Canary Wharf, 
back then in 1986, Canary Wharf was still wharfs, was still a, a port which slowly started to become a financial center because they kind of moved the port from Canary Wharf further down the Thames, closer to South End, and, um, and started developing as a center for the, for the, for the expanding financial center. So, so 1986, I was like, what happened in 1986? 1986 was what we call the Big Bang. Okay, there was a big change of London as a financial center of trading in the banks and so on. It opened up the system. Okay? That was in the, during the reign of Margaret Thatcher, if you know the name. Okay? A very important prime minister in this country. She came to power in 1979 and she modernized the country. Because until, until the late 70s, early 80s, the country was riddled by strikes and by, uh, by, by a lack of development. Okay. She came in, she modernized the country. In 86, the market got deregulated. And suddenly, the, uh, the, the London-based institutions had to open up the competition from America and from the continent. So all the American banks came in. JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, we'll speak about them in a second, came in to compete with the local banks and so on. Okay? That was painful for the local guys, because the local British bankers, who were top hats, Okay, and bowler hats, these funny little hats, and walked with uh, umbrellas, with the Financial Times under their uh, um, under their uh, arms, and so suddenly a competition from very aggressive American bankers, from aggressive uh, uh, European people, and others who started competing here. It's very very important. So '86 really changed the market here. Okay, trading of the exchange, uh, the banks, and so forth and so on. Okay. Then in 1995, the FTSE Group was created and the London Stock Exchange uh, held 50% of the stake. Okay? They later they acquired the entire thing. Okay? Mm. Good. Um, in 2017, the FTSE 250 Index celebrated the 35th anniversary. So you need to understand, if I'm an exchange, what I want to do is uh, Want to be transparent, and I want to have an index, an average of all the shares in order to show investors what these shares are doing. You can obviously look at individual shares, but I have a hundred of the largest shares of the FTSE 100, 250, 250 of the largest UK shares, and so on. And so on. I cannot look at the individual shares. I want to see what is the picture here. Okay? So these indices go back 35 years ago. That's quite interesting because if you look at the US market, in the US, the Dow Jones goes back to 1890, so much, much longer. Like the S&P 500, with its predecessors, the S&P 90, S&P 50, go back to the 1920s and so on. So here, a little bit slower. It took a few years, only in the last 30, 40 years, that we really developed indices and on the continent. Uh, okay, very important. Here, okay, interesting. Some mergers and acquisitions and so on. So the London Stock Exchange acquired uh, LCH London Clearing. House, which is very important because when you trade, you also need a clearing institution. You need a platform to, to clear these institutions and so on. Okay? Then they quite swap, clear and so forth and so on. Okay? So the London Stock Exchange not just merged with Milan and acquired Milan, but also now got into the derivatives business. Because previously the derivatives business was outside, was on the, the, uh, the, the derivatives exchange and so forth. So, so they got a hand on that, and now we have. A lot of interest rate derivatives trading here, and as well as, as uh, uh, equity derivatives. Okay, let me say here quite Euroclear and so on. So, so lots of tra uh, transactions that actually means that the London Stock Exchange group is much larger now today than a few years ago. Because on a global basis, we see a lot of consolidation. Okay, the Americans are buying out in Europe, Euronext and so on, bought other and so on, Amsterdam, Re France and so forth and so on. So a lot of competition because you want to make sure that you're big and you can allow your investors to trade all kinds of things and so on. Okay? What's interesting here is that in 2019, Shanghai and London entered into a corporation where you can now trade Chinese A shares uh, via the London Stock Exchange. So you're based here, you want to get hold of Chinese shares, which we think are one of the most exciting markets in terms of potential for the next 20, 30, 40 years, you can execute it. Because otherwise, you would have to go to Shanghai and so on. So if you're based here, perhaps you don't want to open a custody account here and so on. And then here are some other acquisitions here where they acquired some other providers of market financial 
类别是。So, in addition to the equity trading, non-stock exchange uh, develops technology that they send to other exchanges and so on. So that's all about also exporting them the technology and and and, and showing that you have the the expertise. Okay. Um, and the interesting thing is the London Stock Exchange is a publicly traded company that you can invest into. It has been a top performing uh, uh, stock, by the way. Okay, so a very good company, very profitable, and very interesting. Okay, so function here, capital markets, okay, equity is primary market, and secondary market, so when companies come to the market, London is a very, very uh, a good location for companies, whether these are UK companies or international companies. And you remember a few years ago, there was a question, for example, when Saudi Arabia, Saudi Aramco wanted to, wanted to issue new shares, there were big discussions of, would they choose London as a primary, as one of the marketplaces? It would be very good for us because we attract all the business, okay? But then there was a competition from other places and so on, and then there were some kind of other decisions for why we didn't, didn't go ahead. But the end, they okay? chose the New York Stock Exchange, right? No, they didn't go ahead. They just, they just went public in uh, Saudi. Right. And now they are thinking about doing it bigger and so forth and so on because of some local developments and they decided just first to go in Saudi. But how much money can you raise in Saudi Arabia versus raising it here or in America or in or in, in Singapore or Hong Kong and so on. Okay? So London is a very attractive marketplace and we have a lot of international companies that are actually listed on the London Stock Exchange. The FTSE 100 consists the majority of the FTSE 100 companies actually are non-UK businesses. Okay? Which is very interesting. Everybody thinks FTSE 100 is a UK index. The FTSE 100 is not a UK index. FTSE 100 is an index of companies listed on the stock exchange. But you have lots of uh, um, Asian businesses, Russian businesses, and other businesses here because they like the marketplace and so on. Okay? FTSE 250 and FTSE All Share then has lots of UK shares. Okay? But the very large one, like the company, that's good for us. We have fixed income trading here and we have equity derivatives trading here. Good. Technology services, we talked about this. post trade service, information services, indices is very important, okay? Because the indices give transparency, but they also help investors to decide, hey, should I invest into all these companies or should I actually perhaps invest into something that is linked to the index, so index and equity derivatives, <coughs> or just for information purposes. <laughs> okay. Then also CDOL. CDOL is a is a is kind of a a, a a naming system. So every security has got a CDOL number. Okay? Like you have a student number, S something, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Stocks will have a CDOL number. That means if you want to buy a stock, you just don't say, I buy Marks and Spencer's. Because perhaps there are two or three different Marks and Spencer's shares. So every share will have its own, if you have common shares and preferred shares and so forth, it will have its own CDOL number. And it's very important. Unique security identifier. Okay? And then you have some other very good tools, so the RNS, where you learn your service, where actually information has to go out at the same time to all the investors. Because in the old days, until a few years ago, companies would give you information first and then to the rest of the market later, so they would not be appropriate. Okay, so here the London Stock Exchange, you know, here, these are the different uh, indices that we have, put 100, 250, 350 in the all share. And then some smaller uh, uh, markets, A, which are the alternative uh, 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 smaller companies, very small companies, and they're also listed here. Good. Okay, so, so these were the two major institutions that form the backbone that give the stability and make it attractive for companies to come. Okay? So if you have these, this infrastructure, now you need players who use it. Okay? We need people here that can. Come. So we need banks and merchant banks and investment banks who come here actually and use this infrastructure. Okay? So, uh, so we have here the UK banks, a small number of larger UK banks, and you know some of them, Barclays, RBS, which owns NetWest, HSBC, a truly international bank, which actually is much larger 
in Asia and has, as you know, also a headquarters in Hong Kong, in Landmark with the two, I don't know whether you've been to Hong Kong, but if you're in Landmark in Central, then you see in the HSBC building outside the two lines and so on, because it goes back, HSBC stands for Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation. So even the name indicates HSBC, it's not the UK bank, actually, it's a bank that traces its origins back to the trading in China, and so that's why today they will try to kind of revive that. And then Lloyds, one of the large, smaller banks. So we have four large UK banks. Uh, until 2008, they were very, very big. Some of them grew balance sheets up to here and then got into trouble. Uh, RBS uh, was a huge, huge bank, and then they had to shrink their balance sheet. And so, so these are the UK banks. Then we have then we have international banks. And we said in 1986 with a big bang, suddenly the market had to open up and other banks were allowed to come in. Banks are either as commercial banks. What is a commercial bank? A commercial bank is a bank that does all kinds of commercial business. Lending money, taking deposits, uh, perhaps doing uh, some tra trade finance and so forth and so on, as well as investment banking business. Okay? So, uh, so we had over the last 30, 40 years, JP Morgan, uh, other American banks, Bank of America, uh, um, uh, Wells Fargo, and so forth and so on, operating here, yeah, as well as uh, European banks, Deutsche Bank, Fortis, um, and so forth and so forth, all banking, okay? as well as investment banks. Okay? We call them also sometimes merchant banks in the, uh, in the UK. It's the same thing as investment. What does an investment bank do? An investment bank doesn't take money in its deposits, doesn't lend money like a bank, it doesn't do trade finance, they actually are in the either corporate banking, co co corporate finance business, emergency and acquisitions, advising, so getting a fee for advisory, or helping companies to, uh, to do an IPO, so to go into the primary market and so on. And then we have obviously the big players, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, as well as many other investment banks who operate here, okay? And you see, London is the second center in terms of investment banking to New York. You could ask the question, perhaps you say that at the end, at the conclusion of what's the difference between London, New York, and the other places, and so on, okay? Uh, they're all here, okay? Some, so they are headquarters here, they are headquarters somewhere else, but London very often is the second center, okay? It's like, he put that, okay? Deutsche Bank, for example, the headquarters in, in Frankfurt, but London is much more important in New York than the headquarters in, 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 um, in, uh, in Frankfurt. And then we have the marketplace here is also strong in derivatives. We have French banks and other banks who actually are active in derivatives trading, creating derivatives products here. Société Générale, Nipi Paribas, JP Morgan, and Goldman Sachs, and many others. So derivatives, very important here. So we have here three major activities foreign exchange trading really here, okay, why? Because the time zone, we have all these different currencies and so on, so much more currency trading here than in New York, for example. Equity trading, quite large, but much smaller than in the US. The US is much small, much, much bigger market in equity trading than, than the UK, but FX trading majority here, and a lot of derivatives trading here, okay? Derivatives trading in equities, in foreign exchange, and in interest rates, as we said earlier. So, so these are the kind of what I call intermediaries, okay? the banks and investment banks. But I also need people who do the business, who are the primary, the buyers and sellers of that. Okay? And who are that? <coughs> Asset managers, so like all the, the fund management houses, as well as the hedge funds, as well as the family offices and corporates, and even private individuals. Okay? So London is certainly the center for European fund management. Okay? As you know, in the last 40, 50 years, the investing, investing via funds have become very popular. Why? Because if you as an investor want to invest and you have to pick these individual companies, perhaps you make mistakes. You don't know all these companies. So you want to actually use a fund manager who does it for you. Okay? In the old days, you would have a portfolio manager who would just for you. Now we have a fund industry that has thousands of funds in the UK, we have over 3,000 funds, and we have in, the U in the US, mutual fund industry is massive, okay? Which actually allows you to invest into either sectors or countries or industries and so forth and so on, okay? 
So, so it's a very big here, the, the fund management industry, which produces either institutional funds for institutional investors or mutual funds. We call them also unit trusts in the UK, and investment trusts, which are quite close ended funds, that are out there to be invested for, uh, for investors who don't want to pick the individual shares. If you're a very large investor, then you pick the shares, you buy the shares yourself. But if you're a medium sized investor or even a retail investor, you probably go with. Uh, uh, very good funds, and there's a huge now fund industry and fund platforms and so forth. So we have UK houses here, very large houses here, we have European Asian houses and even US houses here, who all want to be domiciled here, A, because of the access to the market, because of the investor base, many investors are here, UK investors, UK pension funds and UK institutional investors a huge investments into, into, into equity markets, into other instruments and so on. So it's very important for us to be here. Um, and then some people come here from overseas and look at it as a marketplace. Hedge fund industry, like part of the uh, fund management industry that uses non-traditional uh, uh, strategies, long short, trading, multi strategy, arbitrage, derivatives, leverage, and so forth and so on. Big market, actually, hedge funds go back to the 1947-48, 1960s in America, in, in Europe, in, in the UK since 1992. So the first hedge funds actually started in 1992. And one fund that started in 1992 is still in operation. I happen to know the, the, the fund manager. He's still running this, he's one of the first guys. He worked for a traditional house and started a hedge fund, and now runs a hedge fund and a traditional business. Uh, and in with several billion on the bank and so on. The real growth started in 2000. Is in 2000 with the with the market crash. People were kind of a bit uh, um, frustrated with the performance of the of, of funds and so on. They wanted to turn the funds and so on. So now the industry is around three trillion in assets, and uh, and probably 30 percent is based here in the UK. And then we say it's the second center after New York City in terms of hedge funds. Okay, so with the majority of the hedge funds based in the, in, in the US, in New York, and then here, and then the rest of the world. Private banks and wealth management. So we said, in terms of investors, obviously we have institutional money, and then we have private money. And private money is either goes by the private banks, if you're kind of an affluent or, or kind of uh, affluent or, or, or wealthy person, high net worth individual. Uh, if you're larger and you have a family office, and I guess you know what a family office is, family office being a, 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 a setup that looks after the money of either the founder of the family office or a few families and so on. So it's like a private investment office, okay? Just for one investor, one family, or group of families. So they're seeing the family offices. Multi-families, very very important today. Okay, and some family offices have just twenty or thirty million under management, and some family offices have five hundred million or billion under management. So some are very very big, some are multi-family, some are single families. Not just in the UK, obviously, all over the world. Okay, private equity, venture capital, also very important players in this market. They are not active in the uh, public markets, right? It's private equity, as it says, invests into private companies. But sometimes a private equity firm with a private equity firm would look at a company that is listed on exchange, buy it, and take it private. Or has a company that they bought a few years ago, is now profitable, and now want to sell it, and rather than selling it to another company or another private equity firm, now bring it back to the market. So sometimes you have private equity firms which actually take companies from the public markets, restructure it, make it better over a few years, and then bring it back to the public markets and so on. Okay. Uh, venture capital, so this is the early stage, very important industry here um, because of the creativity of the market, and in particular in the tech sector, I think we're very, very strong. So Brexit. So we talked about all these players and so on. What happened with Brexit? Is there a risk and so on? So 2016 was a real shock, okay? Nobody expected the UK to vote to leave the European Union. 
okay? It was a shock, okay? People got shocked, including myself, okay? So on the 23rd of, 23rd of June, 2016, we had the result, and suddenly it had swapped from being actually we stay in the European Union to the majority, a small majority to leave it, okay? Then I looked out of the window, and I, so life continues, right? It's unpleasant, we leave this, but life continues. And over the last few years, we've seen that, <coughs> obviously you've seen it here, potentially, lived here and so on, unpleasant, lengthy discussions of how we live, and now we left. Okay, now we have to find out what is the solution with it. So, as I say here, 2020, life continues. Okay, and this new, this Brexit now creates potentially new risk, okay, because the existing relationships are no longer there, okay, but also creates new potentials, new uh, opportunities, okay? It's a little bit like you leaving home, okay? Or a divorce between uh, um, husband and wife, okay? They can no longer do it, they go on. It's not always sometimes, sometimes it's good, okay? Because sometimes you're solving the problem and you're moving on. So I want to be relatively positive, I want to say it will create opportunities here, it will be challenging in some sectors, it will be difficult perhaps for the financial sector, it will be difficult, difficult for some trading, for importing, exporting business and so on, but potentially it creates a lot of opportunities, new opportunities. Because suddenly you need lots of lawyers, you need lots of new accounting, new, new, new all kinds of systems and so on. So they will actually create new work and so on. Um, so it could be a good thing, okay? So far, we haven't suffered so much, uh, too, too much yet. Obviously for some people, it creates now issues with regards to immigration, with regards to staying here, and so forth and so on. But my view is it will potentially be okay, and the banks and asset managers are all, all, all are very work towards Brexit, they set up institutions and, 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 and subsidiaries in Europe, so in case they can no longer operate out of London, they can also now operate out of some European um, domiciles. So, what's the conclusion? Conclusion is, number one, London has been the financial center, as I said, since the 17th century, and it continues to be the center, okay? Even with Brexit, nobody can say that there's less interest here, okay? Everybody wants to come here. I don't see less people coming here. I see more people who are interested here. Yes, perhaps it's going to be more difficult for Europeans to settle here, because perhaps now they need to find some kind of uh, right to stay here, and so on, but it is a very attractive marketplace for all of the world. Okay. It's creative, open, and adaptive. Okay. I think the strength of the United Kingdom is whoever lives here, okay, whether you were born a Brit or an English person going back, tracing your ancestry back 500,000 years, or whether you just came back 20 years ago or five years ago, people are a creative here, and they, they kind of like the environment here. Okay. So I think you continue to be a leader despite all odds. Okay. There's competition, obviously, from the US on the one hand, and from Asia and Europe on the other hand. Europe would like to take part of this cake away because it's a very profitable business for us. You need to understand a large chunk of our GDP here is produced in the southeast, which is London and, and the surroundings of London and so on. But our creativity, the language, uh, the, uh, the law and the infrastructure here makes it a very interesting proposition. So with that, and very positive that we continue to be a marketplace and it will attract people. Any questions? All happy? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. If you need anything, you can send me an email. If you find me here on the campus, thank you for listening. Thank you very much.